Good morning. It's a joy to be with all of you guys. Um, and today, but, um, for those of you who are visiting, it's a real joy to have you with us. I'm Pastor Fergus, and I lead this church together with an amazing team of leaders. It's really a joy uh, to see all of you guys here packing out this place on a Sunday morning, not least of all, on Resurrection Sunday. I want to declare to you the Word of God from Psalm 16. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good beside you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrow of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood. I will not speak their names with my lips. Yahweh, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. My boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless my God, Yahweh, who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I will always let the Lord guide me because He is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely for you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the paths of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand is pleasure forevermore. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you do not abandon Jesus to die and to decay. Neither do you abandon those who are found in Christ to death and decay. But Lord Jesus, you lift us out of death, Lord God, in Christ, into resurrection and out of it into everlasting life to live forever in Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you, we celebrate you, we praise you, Lord God. On this day, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, church, as we were praying praying and praising and declaring uh, um, the excellencies of God through the songs, the Lord just reminded me all over again that we do not just praise in the good times. How many of you know that? We don't just praise in the times of, of wellness, of goodness, and of celebration. We praise God even, and maybe especially through times of darkness. We praise God especially through times of barrenness, and of wilderness, and of pain. God has appointed for us to praise Him through the pain, through the sorrow, through the grief. And so church, whatever you walked in here carrying today, I want you to know that the praise, praising of God is the most appropriate response. Whether you came in with joy in your heart or you came in with a burden on your shoulder, praising God will be, will always be the most apt response. Oh church, let us just take a moment right now and just set our hearts upon Him. And let's just set our hearts, whatever you walked in with, whatever you woke up today carrying, whatever is in your heart or on your head or on your shoulders, whatever that is that you are holding, just bring it before the Lord right now. Let's take a moment, just take a moment. Let us not rush this moment, but allow the Spirit of God to come and bring the place of your pain, the place of your trial, to intersect with the place of His resurrection. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name. For 
evermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god oh lord our god oh lord oh lord our god oh lord our god oh lord oh lord Oh, Father, we praise you, Lord. We praise you with every, every fiber in our being. Let every breath that we have praise the Lord. And all of God's people say, Amen. Church, today is Resurrection Sunday. I have a personal preference for calling it Resurrection Sunday uh, rather than Easter because it reminds me um, of the resurrection. It extra reminds me. Not that Easter doesn't remind me of His resurrection, but Resurrection Sunday extra reminds me. It reminds me that actually every Sunday, we gather to celebrate resurrection. You know, for the ancient Jews, of course, you know that they are observant of the Shabbat, the Sabbath, right? And how many of you know which, uh, 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 which day of the week is Shabbat? It's Saturday. In fact, the BM word is Sabtu, right? Sabtu is a derivative from the Arabic, right? Which is a derivative of the, all the common languages there of Shabbat, right? But do you know why we celebrate the rest day, the church day, um, the weekend, the full rest day on Sunday. It's because of resurrection. So every day, every week when we gather on a Sunday here, we gather in commemoration of resurrection. And that's why for the Christians in Acts and after that, you see after that, you know, through church history, the church started gathering no longer on a Shabbat, okay, where in the early days they would go and visit uh, the synagogues and share God's word there. But as the church became established, they decided to gather on the day of of Jesus' resurrection. You know, I was just declaring to you just now, Psalm 16, and it ends very beautifully. It says this, I'll say it again. Therefore, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices. Church, I know on a Sunday we come in and we don't always, we aren't always able to bring our whole being to rejoice. Some days our mouths are singing and our heads are somewhere else. Sometimes our heads are in the words of the song, but our hearts are somewhere else. But, Lord, but the Lord has given us this word, this picture, a vision of what praise looks like. My whole being rejoices. My body rests secure. Do you see, church, the integration between what your, your, your heart is worshipping and the security in your body and you will not abandon me to death. The psalm says, you will not abandon me to Sheol, that is the place of death, and you will not let me see decay. But what do you do? How, do, how does God not abandon us to decay and to the place of death? He cuts open a pathway from dead ends. He opens up a road so that we can defeat dead ends and, and escape death so that we come out on the other side. It says in the Word, you reveal to me a path of life. And in your presence is abundant joy, full joy, complete joy. And I've put it on this poster. If you walk over there or walk near, it says here in a little very small text. Can any one of you read it? What does it say? It says, never ending explosive life because it would occur to some of us that the images that the world paints us of what heaven is like might in fact be quite tame and quite tepid I was sharing over in an Instagram reel earlier this week that most of the time, we get our ideas about what heaven is like from 
the media from cheesy movies and TV uh, shows um, that show heaven as, I mean, the worst one <laughs> is the one with angels playing on harps, floating on clouds, right? And I know you guys are a mature crowd. You're past that one, right? And then, as I, and then sometimes we have this picture of heaven as being this misty place and it's just foggy and you can't see anything in front of you and then the mist clears and someone comes and draws you forward, you know? And then for some of you, you imagine the one with the big staircase, right? The one staircase where everybody who is good in your life is nicely um, organized and ordered, arranged on the staircase and everyone just like, welcome. <laughs> it's like, welcome to Air God, you know? Um, we shall be flying, you know? And, and the thing is, God has appointed for us in His presence abundant joy. And it's not just something that is peaceful, though it will be, but it's not just calm and peace. It will be full, abundant, powerful. We just sang that song. What a powerful name He is. If He has such a powerful name, then wouldn't it be extremely powerful in His presence? where He is at the end of the days. Wouldn't it be full of life and life would just bubble up? Have you ever watched a movie and it just reaches that climactic moment where it's just so cheeky, right? So, so exciting. Like your heart's going to jump out and then you go like, ah, 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 and then you, you don't say it out, but it's like you go, <laughs> right? Have you ever had that before? Right? And sometimes we just cry, right? We just break into tears. Um, we recently got Disney Plus in our home, right? And it's no surprise because we got Disney Plus because the Eras tour has just come out. And my wife was telling me that when she went for it in the cinema um, uh, with Rachel, and they were just watching it, and one, turn to the left, and this girl's crying like, ah, ah, right? And they turn to the right, another girl is like singing to every line, and she's like wiping off tears or something like that. You know, when we experience something that is transcendent. It's a moment that we are already familiar with. We have seen glimpses of it. We have tasted it in part. We are familiar with it a bit, a bit, a bit. And not the whole thing. You have tasted it here and there. And then when you finally taste the full thing, it is just a transcendent experience. Just like how if you were to go and watch a football game and you've seen your favourite players on screen and then you see them in real life and they score a stoppage time winner and they run to the crowd and you just go absolutely bonkers. Same thing for the era store. You've heard the song, you know, in the recorded version so many times, but you finally see it presented to your life. Something is transcendent when you have experienced parts of it bit by bit by bit and then when you finally encounter. Now, I just want to say this. We've all experienced God in varying measures. You've experienced God through times of pain. You've experienced God through times of trusting. You've experienced God through times of joy and celebration. But I want you to know this. When we eventually come before Him at the ever, at the point of everlasting, at the place of live forever, when we encounter Him once and for all. The Bible says that today we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. One day we shall see what? Face to face. One day we shall see face to face. It will be not just a tepid kind of calm. It will be never-ending, torrential, explosive life and joy and power. You know, often we say we want to get to that place. We want to go to heaven. We want to go to where God is. We want to experience and taste of the joys that's described in Psalm 16. A long time ago, I heard a, a, a Christian song um, that begins with a, with a bluesy kind of riff um, where the singer, um, he declares, he makes this declaration. Yeah, I'm going to try to replicate it for you. He says, everybody wants to go to heaven. True, right? But nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. And then he goes on, right? So true, huh? So true, huh? We all want to go to heaven. And then we try to stave off death. 
We want, to, we want to cross the threshold into eternity and yet we want to stay far away from that finishing line. You know, actually, I spent some time thinking about this. Earlier this week, it occurred to me that ours is probably the, not probably, easily the most photographed generation of human history. And every time you take a photo, you're preserving a little moment, a slice of life. You're just freeze-framing little moments of life so that we can hold on to things as long as we can until our hard drive crashes. And then we cry for the things that we have lost because when our hard drive crashes, we realize that life is full of impermanence after all. And the reality is this. We are a generation that tries for tries to keep everything staying forever, lasting forever, living forever, right? We want to try to preserve everything around us. We try to preserve our health and there is, there's no fault in that, right? We try to keep ourselves young as long as possible and then suddenly, you know, age becomes a touchy subject. You know, don't ask anyone their age because you should not have someone reveal their age, you know, because you know what? Nobody wants to remember that we are all growing older every day. We, we try to keep our, make things last forever through keeping healthy and there's nothing wrong in staying healthy as everything right in stewarding your bodies well, you know. Um, but, but it's fascinating, you know, I, I, I recently uh, ran some searches, was looking at some uh, advertisements online and I saw that both Nike and Adidas have running shoes called Infinity, right? We are fascinated and we are in some senses obsessed by this power to have no limits Impossible is nothing, right? Uh, uh, to have no limits, to be able to go on forever, to have nothing that can hold us back, you know? Sky is not the limit. Sky is no limit, you know? And so on. We want our bodies, we want our achievements to last forever, stay forever. For those of you who are entrepreneurs, your dream probably is to, is to raise up a unicorn company so that the impact of that company, is not money uh, by the way, right? Because if you're if you like a tech entrepreneur, you're not thinking about the money, you're thinking about the impact on the social uh, uh, life, on, on the way the world lives, right? It's your greatest joy if you can invent something, build a company that transforms the way the whole world works so that your achievements too will last forever. And even when other technologies supplant it, your name is written into the book of earthly technological advancement, right? And that becomes part of your legacy. But you know, let's not go so lofty into that. In our home, I do the laundry, right? And if you do the laundry, how many of you do the laundry in your house? Can you just give me a little wave? I feel the solidarity uh, with all of you, right? Gosh, how do I wish that my laundry can stay forever? The most satisfying feeling is when you have like hung everything back into the children's cupboards, you know. Everything that needs to be folded is folded, it's in the drawers. Everything that needs to be hung up is hung up. Everything is fine. You look at the laundry basket, it's empty like the tomb on Sunday, right? And you go like, yes, my life has resurrected. I have joys forevermore, right? But it doesn't stay forever. Their laundry just like half a day, half a day, the evening when your kids come home and they're, they're mud on their pants, you know, and there are stains all over the clothes and it goes in and it's like, okay, Okay, we go again. Just do it. We go again, right? And so, it's not just about the achievements in the world. It's not just about the laborious things, the Sisyphean things that we have in our day-to-day -day life. It, is also, it also extends into the human relationships that we cultivate and foster and hold on to, you know, because there is not a single one of you who wants to part with your loved ones. Not a single one of us do. We want to hold on to those relationships and in some senses, we want to hold on as long as possible, not just to the relationship. We want to hold on to the relationship as it is at the most pleasurable season or time. 
one of my one of the songs I've been listening to a lot uh, uh, recently is a song written by is this indie uh, 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 girl singer and she sings from the voice of a mum uh, who's looking at her little daughter growing up and she says why can't you stop time you know how long before I can't call you mine right sweet little girl help me stop time <laughs> yeah, and then she playfully says you're not allowed to be 19 you have to stay my precious baby right and it it represents uh, maybe the heart of every young parent to see your little child growing up it's like oh my gosh my little boy you wonder your voice is gonna break no don't don't right or oh, you be a sweet little boy right we want things to stay forever last forever and live forever everybody wants to go to heaven nobody wants to die right but here's the thing what if God wanted things to change in fact what if God always wants things to change and when He changes the things around us, it makes us feel as though like, I don't want that. I didn't want that to change. I wanted you to keep it that way forever. Why didn't you keep it that way forever? And Jesus says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For as high, for as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so, in our way of thinking, at our, at our elevation, which isn't very much to shout about of thinking, we say, God, please keep things the way they are. Let my baby girl stay five and cute, you know? Like, I don't want 15, I want five, you know? Um, let, let my marriage stay in this kind of idyllic kind of moment. Let my business stay as it is. Let all these things be. But God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm going to disrupt things. And change is always disruptive. Even the day-to-day -day passage of growing older one day at a time is disruptive. And God is, in some strange way, always bringing those disruptions into our midst. He has a better plan. And so, maybe nothing lasts forever. Maybe nothing, at least on this side of earth, lasts forever. Though we try our best to cling on to, to things, but the, the great achievements we heap up in our workplaces may, will not last forever. The great things that we can build for the world will get supplanted by another. And last year, we went through the book of Ecclesiastes. For those of you who call this church home, you've gone through it together. While you build one thing, it gets supplanted by something else. And you build one thing, someone else comes and potentially tears it down. Nothing lasts forever. Even cold November rain. I don't know how many of you get that. Yeah. You know, even our families won't last forever. Even the loving relationships we have with one another, sometimes they decay before we die. And that's not fun. Sometimes we see them go into cycles of pain and of estrangement and of separation and of distance. Sometimes we are physically together but our hearts have checked out from each other. Sometimes we lose each other to disease, sickness, to death. Sometimes we lose each other to others. You see, why would God cause all these fleeting good moments just as we can touch them to just keep slipping out of our grip? That He just keeps running away from us. So that at the end of our days, we can say that all of these things is like pursuing after smoke. We're just clinging on in futility to coloured smoke. You know, it looks so real. It's like fluffy pink clouds and you can almost touch it. And as soon as you plunge your hand into it, you realise it's all vapour. It was there, but it was never really there. You see, my church, new things come from old things coming to an end. New things come from old things coming to an end. When God wants to do a new thing, He sunsets the older thing. When God wants to bring about something new, He has to put to death that which was 
old when he wants to create you recreate you into a new creation he has to put to death the deeds of the flesh of old when he wants to do a new thing with a nation he has to put into the grave the nation's prior self and flesh born dna so that he can put his dna into a new people and make them into a new people. That's why he says in, was it First Peter or Second Peter, that you are a holy people, a new creation, right? You are not like who you used to be. I've created you into a new kind of entity. You are salt. You are light. I'm giving, I'm giving you definition of who you are now. A holy people set apart for His excellencies. When God saves you, when God loves you, when God takes you, He recreates you. And in that process, something old has to go. Just last Saturday, we were gathered here and Denise was leading us into praying through Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. And Romans 12 verse 1 says, let your, put your bodies to be like a spiritual Sacrifice, right? Sacrifice your bodies to be like a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Something gets placed at the altar and it dies. And then Romans 12 verse 2, the very next verse says this, Do not be conformed to the ways, to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewal, the renewal of your mind. Something new is being birthed. And I... And I spent some time that Saturday morning thinking and praying through what's the relationship between Romans 12, 2, which is the renewing of your mind, and Romans 12, verse 1, which is being a living sacrifice. And it clicked. I've seen that verse like a million times all my life. It clicked. You can't be renewed until something dies. You can't see newness. You can't see God do a new thing in your life until He puts to death that which is carnal, that which is of our flesh, that which is of our old ways. When God wants to do a new thing, He will bring it out of the sun setting of an old thing. How many of you, you want God to do a new thing in your life? You want Him to make you better. The very notion of making you better means that you've got to change to be better. He wants to... How many of you, you long for some kind of some kind of refreshingness, some kind of newness in your life because maybe you feel stale. Now, I want to speak this over you and I want to pray over you right now. If there's any one of you who feel, you feel that you've reached a place in your life of doldrums, you feel stale. You're not bad, you're not depressed, you're not in pain, you're not crying, you're not in trauma, you're just foggy and stale. I want to pray over you right now, especially. Father, I just pray, Lord God, and bring before you every single one of us who are in a season of feeling tired, numb, lost, foggy, directionless, and just moving from station to station, workplace to home, car park lift to car park lift, day in, day out, feeling that our emotional place is just completely weary and tired and we don't feel anything anymore because to feel might just be worse. Church, you, you bring this place before God. God, you see the place that many of us are in. And Lord, I pray, Father God, that you tumpang tangan, you put your hand upon it, Lord God, and you just cause resurrection power to be transferred out of you, your throne room, your place of power into us, Lord God, so that you today can do a new thing. Create in me a new heart, O oh Lord God. Father, for, for, for 1 Corinthians 5.17 says that I am a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. Lord, when? When can I start feeling like a new creation? I've not felt like a new creation for so long now, Lord God. Father, I'm asking. My hands are open. Open. My hands are physically open right now, Lord God, because I want to remind myself to receive from you. Lord, give me 
newness in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, church, this idea that God wants to bring new things, but He brings it out of a place of death, Jesus spoke about it. He Himself said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. It's an agricultural principle that is there to reflect and mirror the realities of our lives. You have to put the seed into the ground. And can I say this? When you put the seed into the ground, it's not entirely obvious whether that seed is being buried or that seed is being planted. Does that make sense? Let me put it in a different way. We think about burial as a thing of death. We think about planting as a thing of sowing. We put things into the ground in a burial to say goodbye forever. But we put things into the ground as planting to say that in due time, I hope for some return. And I'm going to ask you, when you put a seed into the ground, do you know if it will come alive? If you've planted things before, you know you might want to put more than one chili seed, you know, into that little hole, you know, in the hopes that if four or five of those seeds don't jadi, at least one or two will. And you do it multiple times in multiple places. So I'm going to ask you, how many of those seeds did you plant? And how many of this, those seeds did you invariably bury? It's not obvious from above the ground. You can look at it and they are both in the ground. One is planted, many are buried. But the Lord is there in the unseen place and the Lord puts new life into that which has been put down into the ground. And that's what this verse is really saying. It's saying that if you pursue after life in order to cling on to life, if you pursue after the things of this world that appear like it will give you longevity, it will give you, help you stay forever, live forever, last forever, then those very things, the pursuit of those very things will kill you. You will chase it or die trying. You will get it or die trying. But Jesus says that if you lay down your life, no, yes, voluntarily face death in the face, eye to eye, and say, I'm going to lay down my life, not as a suicide bomber, not, as, not in hedonism, not in recklessness. I lay down my life for the work and kingdom of gospel going out that there is a king in your midst. He has died. He is resurrected. Today he is in our midst. And for this news, I will lay down my life. For this hope, I will lay down my life. He says, preemptively stare death in the eye and lay down your life. And in so doing, you inherit true, everlasting, live forever. Amen? He says this, it is for your benefit that I go away. And they were like trying to cling on to Jesus saying, no, don't go away. Don't go away. He said, no, it's for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, then the counsellor will not come. That's the Holy Spirit. And if the counsellor, the Holy Spirit does not come, then his kingdom does not keep on advancing. Because the physical Jesus will only last on this earth for so long. And it is for his very vocation, he has to go to the cross to die. He must see the ending of one ministry of God before he can birth the next ministry of God. If Jesus did not go to the cross and to the tomb and thereafter to be resurrected, then all of us would not be gathered here today because we would still be, in, we'd be, we'd be there. We'll be wherever he is, Capernaum one day, you know, uh, um, where, where else, right? Bethany the next day, Jerusalem the next day. He gets stoned, we go visit, becomes a tourist attraction. But the physical Jesus said, I will go. This way of relating to me will end. I'm putting that dynamic to death. 
so that I can give birth to a new dynamic. What is that new dynamic? On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. It broke into that upper room and tongues of fire fell on top of everybody so that today you and I, we collectively gathered on a Sunday but outside on a Monday to Saturday are the intersecting place between heaven and earth so that when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on where? Earth. As where? As is in heaven. So that there becomes a tempat bertindih. The intersecting point between what happens here and what happens there. What happens there is reflected here. How can that happen? If you're all clinging on to one Jesus somewhere in Jerusalem, it would not have happened. But He has put the Holy Spirit in you so that you are the temple. You are a walking, moving, breathing, talking temple. And sometimes we become cussing temples. And sometimes we become irreverent temples. And sometimes we become unjust temples. And God reminds us, clean the temple. Clean the temple. Flip the tables. Take out all the junk. Re, 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 recondition your heart. Come back to me. Cleanse your heart. Make room for me. Make your hearts a place, places that are habitable, hospitable to me, that I will enjoy being in this temple, says the Lord. You and I, moving, walking. You don't need to go to the temple in Jerusalem. If you go, it's for historical and tourist reasons. It can be a devotional experience. So church, this the entire premise, the entire premise of, I'm going to, I'm just lost this. Yeah, okay, let me, this thing just went off. So, okay, yes. The entire premise of God's work, pushing into Easter Sunday, is that He had to suffer. He had to suffer, and I've shown it to you there in the picture of the crown of thorns. And that marked the end of one, t one season of Jesus' ministry. In that, it marked the end of a season where He could move about freely. He could go about, He could visit houses, He could go here, He could go there, He could minister even to crowds. And once the news tightened on Him, it was locked down. He got arrested, the crown of thorns was put on Him. He was mocked, He was beaten, and He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, says the people who pray through the gospel, the, the, the book of Romans, right? Paul says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And this time, this little window of even being unshackled, though he started to be tortured, would end. And a new, even more vicious one would begin. He would go onto the cross. He would carry the beam, heavy as it would be, until he could physically no longer hoist it up. And then one man would come, Simon of Cyrene would come and lift it and walk it for him. He would be, his wrists would be smashed into those planks. He would be hoisted up in shame, his whole body brutalized. And I was just thinking just now when we were singing, Oh, praise the name his body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. And I thought about the disciples, Joseph of Arimathea, the Marys, they had come and they embalmed him as hastily as they could before sundown and Shabbat begins. And they did that. And I, and I imagine, I, I suddenly saw myself there, seeing the, the body of my Lord mangled in this way. And you're wrapping and you're embalming and you're hastily making him ready for the tomb. And once your Lord may be handsome, I don't know, but certainly looking normal, now completely wrecked, his body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone You know he was lonely in life because Isaiah says, right, he was a man of sorrows. He was a man of sorrows. And there he lay in that tomb alone. God was putting to death 
one thing so that he could bring to life the next. And on the third at break of dawn, he comes out, right? And the angels were there, shining lights. The disciples run. You know, Mary and, and, and the other women, they go. You know why they go that morning? You know why they go so early? It is to re-embalm him. They brought extra spices. Go look at the, at, at, the, at the resurrection account in Luke. They bring extra spices as if to try to keep the body, that which had died, you know, um, that which, which was meant to be on course to decay. They brought extra spices to re-embalm him as if to preserve that body a little bit more, a little bit longer. Stay just a little bit longer. And they arrived, and the two angels, shining light, said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is risen. He is not here. He is alive. And so they thought they could go and extend uh, the, the longevity of that physical body for just a few more days or maybe a few more weeks. But God had already risen. He had already defeated the very things that would bring His body to decay. That's why Psalm 16, way ahead of its time, way centuries ahead of its time, declares this, that you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal to me the path of life. And in Christ today, you too shall have the, the path of life revealed to you. And in this way, we shall indeed one day live forever. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who lives and believes, there is a living and there is a believing. Everyone who lives and believes in me. So you got to live in Christ. you got to believe in Christ. Why is it being so hard? Actually, if you reject Him, that's what it means lah, to not live in Him and not to, not to believe in Him, lah, right? Anyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you really believe this? Church, there are some of you who have never given, who may not have given your lives to Jesus. I don't want to be presumptuous. Or some of you, you may be culturally, you just walk in, walk out, walk in, walk out. Christmas, Easter, you hear some pastor preach, you know, maybe with a lot of energy, you know, and, and okay, you walk out. Do you believe in this? That if you live in Christ, you will never die? Though you die in this life, but you, you, you die and then you exit from this life into eternal life to live forever? I just want you to take a moment to just allow this reality to rest in our hearts. That God has appointed for you an everlasting life, a good life, full of power, goodness, mercy. But the access to that life is this. There's no other way. He says, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you want to come to my Father, you have to come through me. And that makes sense. It's not trying to be particularly difficult. If, you, if I want to go to your father, I probably have to go through you as well. If I want to go to anyone's father, I have to go through you, or mother for that matter, right? Don't always have immediate, direct access to your parents. And Jesus says, you want to come to my father, you have to come through me. Will you reject the son in hopes of being, still being able to reach the father? You know, to live forever, I began today's word by kind of like parodying a little bit the images of heaven that our popular culture gives us. And the whole, the whole crux, by the way, hinges on this. Is there a vision of heaven that's compelling enough for you to actually want it? Jesus says, Jesus says in John chapter 14, that same chapter that I just quoted from, He says that in my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions, it's like each room is just resplendent, it's beautiful. If it were not so, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be telling you this. And then I'm going to come. I'm going to go. See, he has to go because he's going to birth something new. He's going to go and then he's going to come later and he's going to bring you. Bring you to what? Do you know what the text says when he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to come back and bring you to? You know what he says? Without looking at your Bibles, how many of you know what he says? First, he talked about, I got my father's house, got a lot of big house, lots of big rooms. It, it, almost like a mansion, right? And then he says, 
I'm going to go and I'm going to come and bring you to the, the mansion. Bring you to the house. I'm going to bring you to myself. I'm going to bring you to myself. First, it's almost as if he teases you with the house and teases you with the room and with the mansion. And then he tells you what he's really coming to bring you back to. I'm coming to bring you to myself. Because Psalm 16 says that at my sight are joys forevermore. You know, if you are at his sight, you don't need anything more. When you, at his side, mention no mention, you will, you will sleep in the gutters if you are by his side. It will be joys forevermore. Though you won't, and it won't actually be that way. Because at his side will be all glory, all majesty, all power, all goodness. What a beautiful, wonderful, powerful name he is. Amen? And so, what is heaven like? Revelation chapter 21 says that there will be no more crying, no more dying, no more grief, and no more pain. So I want to speak this over every single one of you. This is the real vision. Forget about the harps, forget about the clouds, forget about the mist and the staircase, okay? Let's just put all that aside in a bin called Hollywood's imagination. I want to show you the vision of God. No more crying, no more pain. It's tackling not just the superficial things around us, it's tackling the real existential problems that we face. Is there pain? Are you hurting? No more, no more tears, no more crying, no more dying. He says, your morning will end. I will wipe away every tear from your eye. And in its place, I bring a river of living water. The water of life will flow. There will be trees on either side of this river running right through the city. And the river flows from the throne room of God, meaning that the waters flow directly out of Him. And it reminds us what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, if you had asked me for water, I would have given you water springing out from eternal life, from a place of everlasting living. And we see that in Revelation 21, the waters come, 22, the waters come out from the throne room of God, the source of all life. And the trees, their leaves will be for the healing of the nations. We see the nations at war. We see the nations in, in, in absolute chaos outside our doorstep. The leaves will be for the healing of the nations. There will be no more night, no more sun. Why? Because God Himself shall be their light. In other words, there will be no more fear of things turning and turning and changing. You, I'm actually describing to you from the book of Revelation a place where that constant change that I was talking to you about appears to no longer be that way. So on this earth, we go through lots of change and I showed it to you at the start. But when we get there, there shall be no more cycles of moon and sun and moon and sun. God, Jesus the Son, will be their light. There shall be no more temple so that your religious acts does not require you to go somewhere. Right now, you are the temple. You neither do you necessarily have to go somewhere except that you gather as a church, not gather in the church. Amen? But one day, Jesus will be everywhere. He will be, His presence will be everywhere such that He becomes the temple. And in that place, all the things that you can see, the material things will be arrayed with God's glory. The city, radiance, was like a precious jewel, like, a ja like jasper stones, clear as crystal. The main street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. You know, gold is opaque. And then he says it's gold, but it's transparent as glass. And so, what the picture you're going to get here is like, is, it, these are heavenly pictures. These are things that we have no earthly description for. And the Apostle John, in, it caught up in this reverie, this, 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 this epiphany. He sees things, he's using human language. It looks like pure gold. And at the same time, it looks like clear glass. And at the same time, it looks like crystal. Church, I'm not trying to woo you with bling. I'm not trying to draw you to His everlasting home with shimmer. But I'm going to show you that in heaven there is life, abundant life, powerful life, high death life, right? Really saturated, intense, immersive pleasure off the charts. 
So it's not just something that is just okay lah, floating lah, macam saja lah. No, it's powerful, it's torrential. I want you to have this vision of heaven that is torrential. And it's good. It's joy, it's like that scene in the movie that makes you want to cry. It's like that thing. It makes you burst. And they worship Him day and night and night and day. Incense arise, right? And they worship Him all the day long. They never tire of it. I get tired of worshipping. At some point, I'll go drink water. At some point, I want to go home. But there, there, with our renewed hearts and our renewed spirits, we will worship, we will celebrate, we will be fullness, explosive life. Amen? So church, God says, look, I'm making everything new. I am making everything new. He said it in Isaiah. He says it again in Revelation 21. Look, I'm making everything new. Behold, I make all things new. The one who conquers will inherit these things. And I will be his God or her God. And he or she will be my son, my daughter. Now, it's just one last thing for us to rest on before we move on. What is this? What is it? What do you have to conquer? You conquer death. Who's conquered death for you? Do you have to conquer death yourself? Who's conquered death for you? What do you have to conquer? What else do you have to conquer? Sickness? Has Jesus, will Jesus conquer sickness for you? He conquers sickness for you. Your bodies, growing old, aging, who conquers that for you? Jesus will conquer that for you. I'm going to tell you one thing you have to conquer. If Jesus conquers everything for you, then why He say, the one who conquers, then you've got nothing to do already, ma. Sama Jesus told you, ma. What for you need to do? He says, the one who conquers right now, remember just now he said, those who live in me and believe in me. And then he says here, the one who conquers, church, there's one thing you have to conquer. is your unbelief. There's one thing you have to conquer is your unbelief. Our lack of faith. Our lack of trust. And even that, he needs you to just take the first step. Ray, lift the stuff and all of that, all the waters will be piled up before you. But I need you to do that. This is a sign that you have conquered your unbelief, you see? You just need you to step into the River Jordan, wet your feet, I don't care. That's a sign that you believe and I'll pile the waters up away from you. Today, God is calling for you. Lift that stuff, step into the water. I want to see your heart grow in belief to conquer that unbelief. That's what the Lord says. The one who conquers will inherit these things. All eyes closed, all heads bowed. I want to pray for every single one of you. And if I can have the worship team on stage. There are some of you, you're in a place in your life where you need to put to death an old thing. An old season. Now, I don't just want to zero in on sins and all those things. But there may even be a season, a time, a thing that you are clinging onto, you refuse. Or at, at, up to this point, you just can't let it go. And the Lord says, Look, I am doing a new thing. The old must go so that the new can come. And I know that it's hard to find the courage. It's hard to find the bottle in order to let it go. The Lord says, I am with you. You can let it go. It's okay. The Lord says, today, I'm putting to death the old thing so that I can bring new life into you. Father, pray after me if you are in this place. Father, we pray and I ask that you help me put to death this old season to see it end, to sunset this thing in my life so that you can give me a new dawn, so that you can bring about newness in my life, Lord God. Father, I surrender. Right now, I think I only have enough gumption to surrender half of it, but I can't give it all up. Lord, help me. Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Lord, help me let go of the full, whole thing. Oh, Lord Jesus, right now, 
I'm just going to abandon it to you. You take over the whole thing, Lord. I can't anymore. And so you do with it as you will, Lord God. I surrender. The whole season, I give to you. And I'm going to trust you to give me a new season in my life. I pray this for every single one of you who are putting to death the old season so that God can bring to life the new one. Some of you, you're struggling with grief, struggling with loss. Some of you are challenged daily by your inability to snap out of it. You're stuck in that moment. You can't get out of it. And you're going in a loop, in a cycle. You feel paralyzed. And for all intents and purposes, you may have been paralyzed for years now. You've not really made gains ever since you lost that someone, that something. You've had a dream or a loved one put to death. Today I speak newness over you and I want you to pray this with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, help me truly bury this thing so that I can live again, Lord God. Father, help, Lord God, this burial become a planting, Lord God, so that out of its death can come newness of life, Lord God. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you do this work to cut me off from the entanglements of all so that you can lift me up, Lord God, and bring me into a new place and lift me out of darkness. Help my wheels turn again, Lord God. Help my heart live again, Lord God. Help my life be joyful again, Lord God. Lord God. Give me a new purpose. Open up a new vision for me, Lord God, so that I can come out of this deadness into a living forever kind of life, Lord God. Oh, help me by the power of this name of Jesus. And I want to pray for those of you who have never given your life to Jesus. If that is you, I want you to repeat this after me. And when I say you have never given your life to Jesus, I also want to include this. You have never seriously taken Jesus. You've never taken Jesus as one whom you would say, you know what, I'm going to take Him seriously from now on. If He really is God of the whole world, created me, and I'm chasing all these other things, and I'm ignoring Him, and I'm trying to stave off aging, I'm trying to stave off defeat, I'm trying to stave off death, and pretend it doesn't exist. I think I'm infinite, but only He is infinite. I want to give my life to Jesus and take Him seriously once and for all. Pray with me. Jesus, come into my life. Give me a vision of forever. I receive You as my Lord, as my Saviour, as my King, and as my God. And I don't know where this will take me, but I'm going to trust you. You lead me where you lead me. And I will be a good follower. I will walk as best as I know how. And when I stumble, pick me up and help me walk all over again. But let me never stop following you. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Shall we rise to our feet and praise His name? Oh, praise His name, church. Come on, let's just lift up our voices on this day. Oh, oh, oh praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Praise His name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Praise His name. Oh, praise His name forever, forever, forever. Sing your praise, O oh Lord, 
just want you to rest in this moment, church. Just want you to rest in this moment. I believe the Holy Spirit draws you into a decision. Oh Lord God, we thank you that on this Resurrection Sunday, we can step across into newness. We can cross the thresholds of decision and say yes to forever. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that today the powerful name of Jesus is bringing healing to come upon us right now. Every sickness in the name of Jesus Christ, I command sickness, leave right now in the name of Jesus. Leave right now. Every cell in our body be restored. Dead old cells die in the name of Jesus. Healthy new cells live and be born in the name of Jesus right now. Every mental ailment right now, I demand and command you, leave right now in the name of Jesus. Every spiritual oppression right now, recede and leave in the name of Jesus. Get out right now in the name of Jesus. And under the invocation, which we do in reverence and holy fear, we invoke the name most wonderful, most beautiful, most powerful, the name Jesus Christ over every place of death that you forgive and you heal and you bring newness and life and every vessel that has brought death upon one other person whether it be our speech or whether it be our hands or whether it be in our hearts, cause us to be bringers of life and abundant life. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace and abundant, joyful, never-ending, explosive life. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. All of God's people shout aloud praise. Praise Him in the sanctuary. Amen. Praise God. He's so good. I'm so, so happy to see you guys here today.